Yes, yes, it is real life every day. Um, and I think, I think that's something uh, we definitely are gonna talk about here. Um, so just as an overview for those who aren't familiar with Catholic Charities or just know us as the local soup kitchen or maybe yourselves have kind of said to somebody on the street, oh, why don't you go to the Catholic Charities office down the street? So if you don't know who we are, this gives you a little bit of an overview. We're actually quite large. We have a national office in uh, Alexandria, Virginia, but we are a network agency. So each Catholic Charities office across the United States is owned and operated on it, uh, all by itself. They're their own 501c3s. We're very decentralized. Um, so we serve as a network organizer. Uh, certainly our services are, as you see on the board, uh, many of the social services that you are familiar with. Uh, the interesting part of certainly is that in times of a disaster, any one of these services then turns into a disaster service. So we are in the business of tending to people's daily disasters. And then at the time of a disaster, then we have to tend to the community disaster in any one of these areas. <clears throat> of course, uh, as we've heard a lot of information this morning, I, I do have to put out the disclaimer and the reminder that if everything went perfect, it wouldn't be called a disaster. So we always try to keep that in mind that we certainly um, try to coordinate our services as best as we can. Um, combined forces, as a network, were huge. Uh, however, the services that, for instance, at the national office uh, that we provide in disasters, I have three and a half staff to cover the entire United States and all the U.S. territories, including Hawaii, Alaska, and the Caribbean. I think we have our services go from the Caribbean all the way out to Guam. Um, so it's uh, myself and uh, three staff. We're very busy all the time, very front line. Um, as you mentioned. But Catholic Charities as a network, I think it's important to note that um, on a normal day, we serve about 10 million people annually. I mean, it's a lot of people. Over the course of our 100 years, we have served well over a billion people in the United States who've been in need of those services. Um, our staff base uh, or our volunteer base is quite large. Uh, and as you can see, putting in many volunteer hours each year. But I think the most astounding thing that people don't realize is that combined, we actually employ more people in the United States than American Airlines. Yeah, 65,000 staff across the country, full-time staff. Um, so yeah, it's more, more than American Airlines. So uh, let me just talk a little bit more about our disaster response and how we uh, work and operate. We do consider ourselves an early responder. Uh, I am very adamant about educating our Catholic Charities offices that they are not a first responder. Uh, I do not want them out there uh, rescuing uh, people, uh, that they have to know what to do once the person is rescued. And so we've certainly coined the term early responder and make sure folks are aware of that. Uh, we've talked about funding, and funding is one of the interests of this group. We provide funding to our Catholic Charities Network at about $40 million uh, in grants per year. These are private dollars that are given to us. However, I say this with the disclaimer that it, it's such an ocean wave. I mean, you can have a large disaster, Katrina, $160 million. And then you have the next disaster and nothing. Absolutely nothing. Gustav and Ike, $200,000. How could you have Gustav and Ike and just bring in $200,000? There are other agencies that are larger that have um, direct marketing bases and get the media that uh, bring in a lot more. And so it's a real way we could get lots of money or no money. And I think that unless you are the largest in disaster um, agencies, then that's exactly how your bottom line goes. So this is an average over uh, seven years. 
uh, we've taken this average. It's about $40 million, but it is very, um, very dependent on how the media portrays what's going on um, and the other agencies that are involved competing for that same private donated dollar. Um, we do have a federal contract, as Jonathan made mention to, with uh, the Administration of Children and Family to specifically perform disaster case management services. Now that's a very important contract to Catholic Charities and Catholic Charities agencies throughout the country. But it is important because it funds only the administrative piece, where many times you get direct service dollars uh, to donations are many times used for direct service dollars for health care, for uh, utility assistance, for all these other things. It's the administrative piece that's never covered. And so the federal contract allows us to perform the administrative piece. And then certainly we try to supplement that with the direct service dollars that come in from private donations that could be up or down. Um, we do reach about uh, a half a million people a year in disaster services because we do respond to um, up to 80 disasters a year, myself and my staff. That's not including the whole network, just myself and my, my three staff. We focus on uh, up to 80 a year. And that's uh, the higher number is due to the fact that we are not federal declaration bound. Uh, so if there's a disaster that doesn't fit under a federal declaration because there isn't enough houses destroyed or there, um, there, it doesn't fall within whatever criteria FEMA may have, we still have to respond. A uh, great instance is when uh, there's a tornado that rips through a migrant community of undocumented workers. Well, you know what? They're undocumented, so guess what? They don't count, and they're not in any FEMA account. So where do they go? They come to Catholic Charities. We certainly um, do a lot of work to support our agencies. We have to be a jack of all trades. Uh, so we've got an interest in every aspect of disaster that we uh, can have. Uh, my staff are highly qualified. Uh, both myself and my staff uh, come with uh, many combined years of international disaster assistance work as well as uh, domestic. And we have reach into all the uh, aspects that we can in order to support their work on the ground. Just a little bit about, um, I, you know, our services, again, they're provided to anybody. If there's a verifiable need, they can prove that they've got uh, disaster damage, then uh, certainly they qualify for services. We heard early today, somebody was talking about FEMA, and, you know, FEMA has every right to return somebody to, or something to that state where it was prior to the disaster. And we, as a social service agency, have to take a look at that and say, well, what about the guy that was living under the bridge? And he was affected by the disaster and he qualifies for disaster services. Are we successful as a social service agency by returning that person to underneath the bridge? Does that really make a lot of sense? And does that cost more money? And so we really take a look at how we can improve those systems. Um, certainly in a disaster, as all of you are well know, we have those that had uh, chronic poverty issues prior, but then, you know, they tend to fall through the cracks. During a disaster, we end up with a new level of poverty. These are the acute poor. These are people who have never accessed social services in their life. They live from paycheck to paycheck, and because of the disaster, have fallen into poverty. They're some of the most very difficult uh, people to access and to provide services for because the last thing they want is charity. Um, our average long-term survivors, 62% uh, of our disaster survivor clients are female heads of household. 60% uh, have an income of less than 39,000 a year. 
And of course, we have another growing population that continues and will feed into our next presentation, I'm sure, is 28% of our disaster survivors uh, that need critical assistance are over the age of 62. And they're also the ones that fall deeply into the acute poverty category. We uh, take a lot of measures, or as many measures as we can for what little dollars we have to do preparedness planning. Um, there's a great uh, indicator that says if, there, if for every dollar spent on preparedness, $7 is saved in response. That's a, a direct research quote from the World Bank. Um, and it's, it is very viable particularly here in the United States. So we take that seriously. We have a disaster preparedness and response network where we hold webinars uh, on everything from mental health to um, medical services to case management. Uh, we hold, uh, we've opened up an, uh, an institute where we hold an institute every year. It's called the Applied Institute for Disaster Excellence. It's held once a year somewhere in the United States as we choose. Um, and it's a week-long course for Catholic Charities agencies and staff to become uh, in-depth, get in-depth knowledge about having to respond in a social service manner to disasters. Um, we have two cadres of folks that together combined are over a thousand people ready to deploy if we need personnel. These are trained, credentialed people who can deploy at any time. We say two because one is attached to our federal contract and the other one is uh, a little more, and there's a little more leeway outside the federal contract. And then we certainly are, are being funded. We have three programs currently in the area of, of, of resiliency that are coming through us through the Margaret A. Cargill Foundation and the American Red Cross. So here's our current reality. We've got all these challenges, little staff, small resources, and guess what? The severity of disasters are just on the rise. Um, disaster seasons have shifted. Who's ever heard of having to respond to tornadoes on Christmas Day? You know, just it's just been a very big whirlwind, a whole shift in the weather patterns. Uh, disasters come in pairs. Katrina Rita, Gustav Ike, Irene Lee, Superstorm Sandy that was both a hurricane and a snowstorm blizzard. Just amazingly bizarre pairs that these larger superstorms are coming in. We've also got the uh, <clears throat> added factor that man-made disasters or terrorist uh, attacks have become the new disaster. <clears throat> This has, uh, causes very different kinds of challenges, particularly in mental health. Mental health for a hurricane or post-disaster stress is very different than if someone feels terrorized. And so how do we take a look at that in, in uh, the area of disasters? We've said already that disasters don't discriminate, but I think it's also important to note that states and local communities may not be as prepared as we think. I've recently uh, been working with the state of Connecticut and uh, they asked me how, how many disasters in the seven or eight years um, just in the United States have I, have I completed? And I said, oh, about three or 400, you know, it's what, what we work on. And they're like, wow, you know, we've only done three, you know. And so they really look to others to pull in and help them. And so uh, they may not be as we think. This just is a, is a visual to just show you. This is just from January to July of 2013. These are just the severe weather reports on tornadoes and heavy rain and hail. That's it. But let's take a look at those same information and overlay it with some poverty statistics. Uh, the yellow states that you see, uh, 22 states in the United States have uh, heavy or extreme poverty pockets within them. Of those, um, 
we have about 80% that have received more than 65 federal declarations in the last 50 years. That's more than one declaration, federal declaration a year, not to mention all those others that don't qualify. And how do we um, tend to some of these uh, when we can hardly recuperate from the previous year? Some of our lessons learned, um, particularly in health and disaster recovery. Um, first thing is disasters are local. We've heard this before prior in the conversations. Resiliency funding, resiliency planning, preparedness, mitigation, anything that we can do uh, on the front line. Um, I put up here volunteer fire departments. Most of the United States, uh, well I should say 46% of the United States lives in communities with less than 30,000 people. Um, these are other small communities or rural communities that depend in an, an enormous amount on their volunteer fire department to provide medical care at the time of a disaster. Okay. These volunteer fire departments are made up of men and who have full-time jobs and do this um, uh, on their own, of their own good heart. Um, they're trained, but certainly uh, this becomes a big burden. Volunteer fire departments awful, oftentimes will um, have a decrease after a disaster of their own medical supplies. They don't have enough time or staff at their fire department to access mitigation funds or services that they need to replenish their supplies. We work with volunteer fire departments and connect them with the Catholic Healthcare Network to help replenish a lot of their uh, supplies. Same goes with uh, EMS uh, hospitals, schools that become emergency shelters, particularly in small communities where they may even become a triage unit, um, houses of worship, and of course local social service agencies. The timing of mental health, um, I, it's, it's really interesting as we see mental health playing out during disasters, there's a lot of money and a lot of thrust up front that says, oh, we've got to get mental health out to the community. But you know what, at the very beginning, in my observation, it's not the immediate community that requires that mental health, but rather the first responder community. It is those men and women who are out there providing first response, who were trained to do immediate responses in a fire call or a police call, and not something that is going to be longer than uh, what your normal day's work is going to be. And so we see a rise in uh, issues and problems, even suicides amongst first responders. Um, certainly some of these other ones. Later on is when the community needs the uh, mental health assistance. We're all familiar, I think, with this chart. At the very bottom, at the uh, one year to 18 month mark, is when we really see an increase in suicides. Uh, that is when, as they start the downslope into that disillusionment phase, when we really need to provide those mental health services. Um, our next lesson has to do with the realities and the stress of people who are over the age of 62. Uh, their lifestyles and responsibilities have changed. We at Catholic Charities see that there are many folks over the age of 62 who are now in charge of and caring for children under the age of 18. Uh, and so this is an added burden. They're second time parents, they have limited incomes, and uh, there's a lot of stress levels that go along with that as well. Uh, their economic security issues have to be taken into account. Certainly they uh, will forego their health if they've got to buy food. And then finally, uh, access, healthcare access for immigrants. Uh, during a disaster is really important. Um, and this is important because many times folks don't realize that, that the people come to this country with different points of learning. Uh, many who are here from um, underdeveloped countries are here uh, with the knowledge that you go to a hospital to die. And so they're not so readily um, happy to go to uh, seeks any kind of health care services at a hospital. We at Catholic Charities have had a lot of success in creating programs where we have community health 
providers during a disaster, something that's a little more familiar to people in, uh, from their country of origin. Thank you. Good, thank you, and we'll um, query you in, in, in just a bit. But we are eager to also get to Lisa Brown, Associate Professor, School of Aging Studies, University of South Florida. Lisa, welcome. 